Hey, Kim Hazelton, the Funky OT here. And I'm gonna get on a soapbox here for a few minutes. And we're gonna talk about normal childhood development. And you know why it's important? Because we have children in our lives and we go through 12 years, 13 years of school, graduate, go to college, get our degrees, are prepared to do things like um, get a job, you know, become a therapist, work with other people, um, learn how to get along in a group project, things like that. But you know what we don't learn in school? Is how children are supposed to develop. And guess what? Most of us end up as parents or we know people with children. And it's so important to know what normal development should look like so we can recognize when it's not going the way that it should. And the reason that matters is because if it's not going the way that it should or the way that it's, we're programmed to, the way that God programmed us to develop, we struggle, our children struggle. And if our children struggle, we as parents struggle and we as teachers struggle and we as grandparents and aunts and uncles and cousins and therapists and the you know, waitress at the grocery, or uh, waitress at the grocery store, waitress in the restaurant struggles. We all struggle. If a child struggles, everyone that comes in contact with that child is going to struggle in some way. Um, and I don't think that's an overstatement because if your child is struggling and they've been struggling for a long time, then as a parent, your, your personality changes. Your, the way you project yourself in the world changes. So even if your child is on their best behavior in any situation, you know that at the drop of a hat that could change and you are walking on eggshells, you are cautious and it changes the way you project yourself on the world so you come across a certain way and people might struggle to interact with you. So it's important to know how a child should develop. And I'm gonna go all the way back, as far back as conception for a little while. And we're gonna talk about reflexes. When we are conceived, we start developing reflexes. Some resources will say we don't develop them until about six weeks gestation, excuse me. <clears throat> but some resources say it's as early as conception. And one of the first reflexes that we develop is called the fear paralysis reflex. That reflex, the purpose of that reflex is self-preservation, it's survival. That reflex recognizes threat, perceived threat. Now, this is only in the womb and that threat is generally a threat that mom is perceiving. So if mom is releasing stress hormones, that baby senses those stress hormones and reacts to it and everything slows down. So we don't have a central nervous system at the point that this reflex starts developing for us. We are just cells. So this reflex is a cellular level response. And the cells, what they will do is the walls of the cells will get thicker and they will stop absorbing from mom those stress hormones and they will also stop excreting waste. I shouldn't say stop, everything slows down. Then we develop, and that's, that's to protect the baby and to allow mom to reserve her resources so that she can handle whatever that stress is and she can go back to homeostasis and stop releasing those stress hormones and then the baby goes back to homeostasis. When we get a brain and a spinal cord, a central nervous system, that reflex becomes a central nervous system reflex and it's primarily housed in the brain stem but the cells still respond. Um, and the baby still responds the same way. So in utero, the baby is learning to breathe. It's the respiration that in and out of the amniotic fluid and the heart rate and the blood pressure are all getting set in the womb. And once we have a central nervous system and the baby senses a threat from mom's hormones, then the baby responds and respiration slows down, the blood pressure drops, um, heart rate slows down, Baby stops excreting the waste as much. The digestion slows down. Everything slows down. That's why it's called paralysis, fear paralysis. Everything slows down so that the baby can stop taking mom's resources and mom can handle whatever that stressor is. And that's the way it's supposed to happen. 
the baby senses the stress from mom, slows down, mom uses those resources, baby stops, per, you know, taking um, energy from mom, and then mom handles it. She goes back to homeostasis, baby goes back to homeostasis, respiration goes back up, blood pressure goes back up to normal, um, heart rate goes back up to normal. And that's just the way it's supposed to be. The problem occurs when that, well, this is one of the problems. The problem occurs when that reflex remains active longer than it should. It should be fully matured. Some people would say fully integrated, about 36 weeks gestation. So four weeks before a baby is supposed to be born. If you're not aware of this yet, a normal pregnancy is 40 weeks. It's not nine months, it's 10 months. Um, so about 36 weeks gestation, that reflex should be fully matured, which means we're not using it. it. We're not obliged to use it. It's not obligatory anymore. It gets replaced by another reflex called the Moro reflex, M-O-R-O -O, reflex. That reflex prepares us for self-preservation outside of the womb. It's actually um, responsible for us taking our first breath because it looks like <sighs> it's, it's, a, it's a movement reflex. So when you think about the sympathetic nervous system um, responses of fight, flight, and freeze, fear paralysis is along the lines of that freeze response. Moro is more of a, <gasps> I'm, I'm taking action here to preserve myself. And the Moro reflex prepares us for when we are outside of the womb as infants and we perceive a threat, a loud noise, a sudden movement of our heads, um, something, a visual stimuli that, that startles us. And um, you can see this actually, America's Funniest Home Videos usually has videos of babies that get startled and go <gasps> like that and their hands kind of shake and their legs go out. And so that's stage one of Moro. Stage two is after the baby's crying, that alerts a caregiver. A caregiver comes and rescues the baby and picks it up and, and we cuddle the baby and we pat its back and we bounce it. And let's just take a little side note here. Patting the baby's back and bouncing it are sensory input. We're gonna keep this in mind for later reference. So we, we rescue that baby and the baby goes into a cute little fetal position. Well, that fetal position is stage two of the moral reflex. And once this, you know, the baby calms down and everything returns to homeostasis, that's stage three. So the moral reflex has three stages. And moral reflex should only be active until about three or four months of age, at which point our final survival reflex becomes primary. And that one is called the Strauss startle response. And that's one that we keep for the rest of our lives. That one is um, a good example of it would be if the wind slammed the door shut in my house and I went, ah! and then I realized that it's just the door or it's just the wind and I go back to homeostasis. So it's almost like, almost like Moro, like you have that, ah! that gasp response um, from some sensory stimuli. And then I go back to homeostasis because I don't need rescuing. Hopefully <laughs> at my age, I can rescue myself. But if fear paralysis or Moro or both of them remain active longer than they are supposed to, then they interfere with normal development. And that's what we're talking about here, normal development. So imagine you have reflexes in your brainstem. They are both brainstem related at this point. If you have reflexes in your brainstem, that are responding to sensory input, to touch, to sound, to head movement, sometimes to smell, and sometimes to sight. And those reflexes are overreacting. They're telling you that these movements, these touches, these smells, these sounds are a real threat. They're perceived as a real threat to your life and you go into a reflexive response. And if you go into fear paralysis after you're born, it looks like freeze. And there are some studies that are kind of pointing toward an active fear paralysis reflex playing a role in sudden infant death syndrome. Because remember I said everything slows down. The heart rate slows down, the respiration slows down, the blood pressure slows down, digestion slows down. And they think that maybe that plays a part if the baby gets startled in its sleep and everything slows down, that it doesn't recover. We don't know, we don't know that for sure. But that's what it would look like outside of the womb. It looks like 
shutting down. It looks like hiding. It looks like dropping to your knees and covering your ears and closing your eyes. And that's what we see a lot of our children doing. When they are stressed, they are oversensitive to sound, sight, smell, touch, and head movement. So head movement would be vestibular. The, um, the receptors are in our inner ears and we respond that way. We respond to head movement, particularly a backwards movement. So that would be a fear paralysis response if it's still active longer than it should be. And remember, we should not see it on the outside of the womb. It's only, it's only supposed to be active in the womb. Moro is a very reactionary reflex. Moro lets you know that um, the individual is feeling a threat because there's, there's movement. There's a flight response. Sometimes there's a running away. Sometimes there's a pushing away. Um, there's yelling, there's crying, there's resistance. And those are the children that we typically recognize that have problems earlier because they're, they're flagging us. They're, they're giving us their red flags. We know that they're having problems. Fear paralysis, when it remains active longer than it should, we don't always see it because if it's just a mild response, then it just looks like a very sedentary child, sometimes a very obedient child, sometimes the teacher's pet because they can sit there and be quiet when the rest of the class is going crazy. But they're still struggling and they eventually end up getting to a point, usually, where they can't hold it together anymore. And Dr. Porges um, has said in some of his interviews that our brain is, well, we know our brain is incredibly smart and adaptive. And our brain will tell us if fear paralysis is telling us to shut down, to slow down and when we feel threat, but a caregiver, say a parent, recognizes that a child is sitting still when we've told them to go do something and, and that something is, is stressing them. Say we say, go get ready for school, go get dressed for school, and school stresses them. So the thought of going to school starts triggering that response. They go into a slowing down. And so they're moving slowly or they're not moving at all. And as parents, we say, what are you doing? We're gonna be late. Go, 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 come on, let's go. The brain will tell them, okay, this reaction's not working because the person who is in charge of taking care of us and keeping us alive is now becoming a threat. Us coming at them saying, we're, I'm going to force you to go into this threatening situation and I'm going to force you to do it faster is a threat to them. So then we become somewhat of a threat in that environment, in that, in that instance. And the brain says, freeze isn't working. Let's try something different. What else do we have? We've got flight and we've got fight. So then you start getting a child who goes into flight and fight, even if the, the fear paralysis reflex is telling them to freeze. So then you, that's when we start recognizing those kids that still have an active fear paralysis reflex will learn that that, that freeze response is not working for them and they will adapt and they will start using other responses that are in their repertoire. And that's when we will get the phone calls from mom and dad that used to be so compliant. They used to listen. They would sit still. Now they're doing poorly in school. They're hitting kids in school. Um, you know, they're, they're pushing, they, they bit somebody in school. And this is why it's important for us to know these things as parents in particular, but even as teachers and grandparents and daycare workers and caregivers, it's important to, to recognize that more often than not, I'm gonna say 99.9% .9 of the time, children want to please the adults in their lives. They want to, but something is presenting them or preventing them from doing it. And if they still have active reflexes, those they're going, we're going to get a reflexive response to their stress. So why am I sharing this today? Because like I said, I get these phone calls pretty much every day from parents whose children are struggling. And I mean, let's face it, we're all struggling right now. This pandemic and the, and the social situation and everything else going on in the world, um, we're all struggling and our children are sensing that. So whereas before 2020, we might have been able to co-regulate our child a little bit better. We might've been able to share our calm with them, hopefully. 
we might have a little less calm to share these days. So I want to encourage you, if your child is struggling, get help. Get help from a qualified OT who understands the reflexes, who knows the fear paralysis reflex and what it takes to integrate it. Because you can't, you can't just come at it with a bulldozer. The brain doesn't like to change quickly. And it doesn't like to be forced to change. And especially if that change makes the individual, takes away the, the protection that that individual thinks that they have, the, the protection of that reflex. So we have to approach it very cautiously. And sometimes that means we start with a home program in our office because hopefully home is a safe place. And we want the child's responses to be adaptive. So if we start doing things that decrease that reflexive response and the brain recognizes that we're taking away that reflexive response, sometimes it digs in a little bit deeper. Sometimes it it resists. And we see behaviors escalate for, a, it usually starts around two weeks after starting therapies. And then it usually lasts about two weeks and it's pretty rough for those two weeks. And then we see things get better. The other thing we need to keep in mind is we have, um, gosh, I can, I can never remember for sure. I think 92 reflexes that start in utero and basically are fully mature around the age of three years old. So you have almost four years of using these reflexes and all of these reflexes serve a purpose. And the, the purpose, the purposes for each reflex are different. They all do something different. So remember I said earlier that we were talking about sensory input, stimulating the moral reflex. The reflexes, with the exception of fear paralysis in utero before we have a central nervous system, the reflexes are all stimulated by a sensory stimulus, some sensory system or multiple sensory systems. And we know that sensory systems can get added on to what causes these reflexes to be activated the longer that the reflexes remain active because neurons that fire together, wire together. So if I hear something and it triggers a moral reflex and then I hear and see the same thing that triggers a moral reflex, now my visual system is going to start triggering that moral reflex. And if I hear, see, and smell something that triggers my moral reflex, now all three sensory systems are going to trigger the moral reflex because they're wired together, because they're firing together. So when we have active reflexes that are utilizing the sensory systems in an inefficient pattern, the sensory information is coming into the brain and we're utilizing it with a reflexive motor and emotional response that is maladaptive. So what we need to do is mature that reflex, integrate it, some would say, and then we need to train the brain to send this sensory information to an adaptive response. So send this information here in the brain, send the, this information there in the brain, and turn down the sympathetic nervous system response, that fight, flight, freeze response. So this is a multi-pronged approach. And in my office, we have a protocol. We start with step one and step two and step three and step four and step five. And we go all the way up until we have a child who is adaptive and functional. Um, and we, we have found certain tools and certain techniques that have been very impactful, but you have to be very careful about how you use some of them. Again, because there can be an, a maladaptive response um, a behavioral response, an emotional response. And so we need to be careful about it. So I hope this information helps you this morning. I'm actually going to put this video on YouTube so I can just share it with tons of parents because I'm, I repeat this information to almost every parent that calls into my office and is concerned about their child with behavior issues. And if you, if you don't know about it, then you wait longer than you need to to find the help. So if you find this video helpful, please share it with others. Um, and if you have any questions, please give us a call at Sense Able Brain Pediatric Therapy. The number is 813-803-3470. I hope this was helpful. And if you um, have any other things that you would like me to do videos on, please let me know. All right. I love you all.